You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. These devices have the power, the potential to transform healthcare. Mm. And I was frustrated with uh, how slowly that, that has been happening. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. Today, Ben discusses a recent op-ed about the danger of privacy at all costs and response from critics. I ponder the Supreme Court asking the Biden administration for input on social media laws in Florida and Texas. And later in the show, Carol Terrio joins us. She's discussing digitization of healthcare with former BBC guru Rory Keflin Jones. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCore Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. All right, Ben, we've got some good stories to share this week. Why don't you start things off for us here? So mine's really a big picture debate. Uh, It was sparked by an op-ed in the New York Times by Reed Blackman, who is an advisor to government and corporations on digital ethics. Hmm. Uh, The op-ed was released during the Christmas holiday, so I think it kind of went under the radar. Not many people paid attention to it. Hmm. Uh, But I think it's an argument that's really worth us considering. The hook for this this op-ed is that Jack Dorsey, uh, the co-founder of Twitter, who is no longer in charge of Twitter, as we know. Uh, said, I hadn't heard that. Really? Someone else has taken over Twitter? Yeah, really? if you'd been in a coma for a year, you'd be very surprised about what's okay. going on at Twitter. Yeah, um, interesting. Sometimes I wish I had been, because uh, it's, it's such a mess these days. But right. Besides, uh, beside that point, uh, Jack Dorsey noted that no government nor any other company should exert control over what he calls... Uh, The tools that are owned by the people. Hmm. Uh, In other words, privacy is the foremost value uh, in social media technology. uh, And it's critical for the future of social media, in his view, for privacy to basically be protected uh, at all costs. Hmm. Uh, And the op-ed notes the benefits of this approach to privacy. Uh, He talks about the app Signal, which I know we've discussed many times on this podcast, how it's used, uh, the end-to-end encryption technology is used by journalists to communicate with confidential sources. Uh, You know, Signal has an ethos, which is that privacy has to be respected at all costs. They don't... uh, Keep any metadata. Uh, it is truly uh, a way to anonymize uh, its users, yeah. uh, and that's its inherent value. The point of this op-ed is that maybe we should reconsider having privacy as the lead value or, or the lead ethos in some of these applications, mm. and that there is a danger in valuing privacy over all else. Uh, and he presents arguments that this obsessive focus on privacy leads to some bad public policy outcomes. Uh, So he talks about how, in the example of Signal, it was used by several members of the so-called Oath Keepers group to plan the riot at the Capitol on January 6th. Mm -hmm. Um, There are obviously some very bad users of some of these applications that value privacy. Right. Terrorists, uh, people who share child sexual uh, material, you know, some of the worst actors out there. 
Uh, and if we value privacy over everything else, that's really going to hamper law enforcement's effort to hold some of these bad actors accountable. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he confronts one of the main arguments of the signal, uh, the signals of the world, and, and other similar applications that you know, if anyone, if anybody has access to this data that we're trying to keep secret, then unauthorized uh, people are going to have access to that data. And what he says is that type of argument reflects a, quote, lack of faith in good governance, which is essential to any well-functioning organization or community. Basically, that we have organizational structures in place at both in both the private sector and uh, the government sector to protect against some of this infor- some of these communications getting into the wrong hands. <laughs> Can I interrupt and just say, meanwhile, back in the real world? Yeah, so that, that's where I'm getting here. <laughs> okay, um, sorry. I didn't mean to jump the gun on you there, Ben. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is a, a, that's kind of a euphoric view of what actually happens. Okay. Uh, and we know that in the real world, bad actors get access to private communications all the time. And we have a lot of historical examples of the government itself misusing some of its own authorities, both in subpoenaing records uh, or obtaining records under our national security statutes, for example, and in simply purchasing uh, data from these applications and using them for law enforcement purposes. Mm -hmm. So the upshot of this this op-ed is that this author is not convinced that we're actually getting more freedom for the people by the people by way of these privacy-obsessed technology overlords. (laughs) Um. And this led to, I think, a pretty compelling critique from Clark Neely and Norbert Michael at the Cato Institute, which is a libertarian think tank in Washington, Mm. D.C. And they basically argue that this perspective that privacy is good and sometimes it's worth protecting the abilities of two parties to communicate, but really, you know, that value is, is... not necessarily superior to the value of protecting public safety or limiting us uh, against bad actors is not grounded in reality and is not grounded uh, historically. Uh, For one, trusting the government and trusting governing bodies goes against the spirit of our founding fathers who defied British tyranny uh, and in doing so used forms of communications uh, that were designed to evade surveillance. Mm. Uh, So a lot of the Revolutionary uh, Revolutionary War uh, and the U.S. Rebellion depended on secure communications. (laughs) One if if by land, two if by sea. Exactly. (laughs) That's what they say in the article. Is that right? (laughs) Uh, I mean, that's literally what that means. And they (laughs) embraced a different view of government and rejected what they call the reductive utilitarianism of uh, this this privacy only proposition or privacy as the most important value. Hmm. Uh, so it goes against the spirit of our founding, and it goes against the spirit of our First Amendment. Uh, First Amendment states unequivocally that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, and being able to speak freely in their view, necessarily means that you're able to speak securely uh, and outside uh, the view of government actors. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that should be enshrined in our legal system uh, that we're protecting, no matter what the form of communication is, uh, we have to protect it from government access. Uh, And then the last thing they mentioned, which I think is is a really important argument, is we have all of these historical examples of government seeking to perpetuate what they call monstrous institutions by ferreting out dissenters, infiltrating associations, and preventing the spread of destabilizing ideas. Uh, This has happened in the Jim Crow era. This happened during the Civil Rights Movement. Obviously, Martin Luther King Jr. was surveilled by the FBI. The Mm -hmm. FBI has infiltrated a lot of what we would now consider beneficial protest movements. Uh, And even though some of the government's actions now in trying to obtain communications, for example, for the purpose of preventing financial fraud uh, or even something like terrorism, while those may seem beneficial, we know that if we put this type of power in the government's hands, it could lead to some of these really dispiriting historical uh, examples. Uh, So Cato basically says, look, we have this history. Uh, The history of government surveillance is ugly. 
Uh, it is replete with the type of false assurances that you see in this op-ed. Uh, and we can't make th- this type of mistake again. Uh, and that's kind of their accusation against this op-ed writer. Uh, yeah. So I think, you know, our listeners can come to their own conclusions uh, as to as to this debate, whether privacy at all costs is really should be the foremost value in the technological space. Um, but I think uh, it, it opens up a really interesting big picture debate that I think, um, you know, is really interesting for us to discuss. So the original op-ed in the New York Times by Reed Blackman, um, do you suppose he was kind of framing this as an all or nothing just for rhetorical purposes? To Because it seems like a bit of a straw man argument to, to say that it's all or nothing, that there is no nuance, that there's no, you know, it's on or off, that there isn't a spectrum or a dial here. So I actually think that's not giving him quite enough uh, credit. I mean, he he is talking about the beneficial use, uh, use of privacy as a value, the beneficial proposition of privacy when privacy is tantamount, like communications between journalism or between journalists and confidential sources. Yeah. Um, I think what he's trying to say is... A lot of the tech bros out there, uh, he didn't use that term. I'm using it pejoratively. Okay. <laughs> uh, but a lot of those type of people don't even want to have the conversation about whether law enforcement should tap our phones uh, or surveil our, our communications uh, right. uh, in, in some of these, you know, bad circumstances like child sexual exploitative material, terrorism, et cetera. Um, is, is that kind of throwing away or, or hmm, disregarding uh, the long history of law enforcement's ability to do that if they get a warrant? Yes. Uh, I think what he's saying is that it, it's at least worthy of conversation. Hmm. And what Signal has done, in his view, is cut off that conversation. It's not giving the government the option even to obtain a warrant because there's nothing to obtain. Uh, they don't retain any traces of the communications between what could be a couple of very bad actors. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think from Blackman's perspective, uh, it's just sort of a, hey, let's step back uh, and to the Jack Dorseys of the world. Yes, I recognize the importance of privacy, uh, but it shouldn't govern the entire technological industry because there are other values at play that are at least worthy of discussion. You know, in in a sense, that is itself kind of a straw man because I think everybody would agree that it's worthy of discussion. Right. Uh, And I think something like Signal is a, uh, and this feels like a bad dad pun, but this is a signal to uh, the rest of the industry that there's a market for companies that emphasize privacy over everything else. Uh, and they've carved that niche in in the marketplace because there's a demand for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think what Blackman's kind of maybe upset about is that there's a demand for these type of end-to-end encrypted applications that are very difficult for for the government to uh, peruse. And I think most people would agree that the market fulfilling that niche is the market playing its its proper role. Uh, and, you know, if such an application can be successful financially, it means that there are a lot of people who really do value privacy uh, at all costs, uh, maybe even at the expense of some of these other values. Uh, and the market is simply reflecting that. Um, so I think that's that itself is, is kind of a straw argument on on his part. Yeah. I mean, isn't it beyond the, the market uh, reality, isn't it also just sort of a technological reality that, you know, this level of encryption is table stakes these days? It's it's not it's not a huge lift for an organization to create something that that uses end-to-end encryption. is is nothing exotic about it anymore. Right, and we know that because there, it's not just Signal that's doing this. I mean, we right. have WhatsApp, uh, for example. Yeah, Meta's working on it for their, you know, uh, private messaging. It's, it's uh, yeah. Right, uh, and I think a lot of the founders of these applications uh, and the companies that have been formed uh, to carry out the the functions of these applications are built on this fundamental value that we need to combat what they call state corporate surveillance of our online activities. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is the one uncompromisable value in their view, individual privacy. Uh, I think 
it is sort of naive to think that with the demand out there and with how easy it is technologically to build this type of application, this type of end-to-end encryption, it's naive to think that we'll voluntarily give that up just because in a limited number of circumstances, having entities in the private sector or the government have access to these communications might lend itself to optimal outcomes for us, bad Mm -hmm. people getting arrested. I mean, I just think that's a little bit naive considering that there are a lot of people who value privacy over everything else. That technology has a capability to really uh, conceal these communications. And, you know, any communications method is going to be used by bad people. Mm -hmm. Uh, No matter what the communications method is, that's been true throughout history. Um, but there is something very fundamental, as as Cato says, about both our First Amendment constitutional rights, um, which require us to have these secure forms of communications, and just in looking at some of these really bad historical uh, examples. I, I wonder, too, just in the... The temperature of of folks these days in our response to this, how much how much we're just fatigued from day after day learning about how uh, so many elements of our privacy are violated for the sake of commerce, that our locations, our interests, our our community, all these things are being bought and sold at the speed of light in order to put an ad in front of us. And we're tired of it. And so is, is there, is, is there a, a pendulum swing that, that risks being an overreaction just because of how tired we are of this? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that point's very well taken. And I think that is the reason that we have applications like Signal is that mm-hmm. this is a backlash to an era where all of our data is being collected. Uh, and we've had these high-profile stories of people's personal information being revealed uh, through data breaches and also uh, through government surveillance. You know, I think what the author of this op-ed is trying to say is that anytime you have one value that's so paramount that it supersedes all other values, Mm -hmm. you are uh, making the moral universe simpler than it actually is. Mm. So what he says is the moral fabric of our world is complex. It's nuanced. Sensitivity to moral nuance is difficult, but unwavering support of one pr- uh, principle to rule them all is morally dangerous. Yeah. I will say, despite kind of looking disfavorably upon this op-ed and um, looking favorably upon the Cato response to it, I have seen a tendency for people to get kind of into a corkscrew or bad spiral where they start by an adamant defense of one principle that leads them to courageously defending bad people. Uh, But then they kind of go down the rabbit hole and end up just finding too much common cause Hmm. with some of these bad people. Uh, And again, bad people is certainly in the eyes of the beholder. Um, There's no uniform definition of it. But I have seen just even through some journalists that I follow uh, and that I've been fan that I've been a fan of in the past, where they are so skeptical of what they see as the U.S. security state, for example. Yeah. That you know that that starts by that that will first manifest itself in them defending a group like the Oath Keepers because their First Amendment uh, rights have been trampled and violated, and mm-hmm. that's fine. That's admirable. Everybody deserves constitutional rights and legal representation. But then, you know, once you make common cause with some of these people, you kind of end up spending most of your time in public defending the bad actors, and you kind of lose the perspective of why you were fighting for First Amendment rights uh, and privacy in the first place. I so I think there is a, a danger in that, that you do come become overly focused on the value that you lose sight of why that value was important and you end up just supporting groups and and individuals that are, uh, you know, you spend your your public time, your your tweets, your Facebook posts, your Substack posts, defending people that are doing really bad things. Uh, And so I do think it's important to step back and be like, well, why am I in this uh, in the first place? (laughs) Not lose the forest for the trees. Exactly. And again, it is in the eye of the beholder. It is subjective. Mm -hmm. Um, But I've just seen that happen where uh, it starts with a really principled defense of something like privacy or 
opposition to the U.S. security state, and it morphs into making common cause with um, people that I think everyone would recognize as, as having uh, objectionable views. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I, I, I suspect most of us, regardless of your um, you know, political leanings, you can think of someone, a journalist, that uh, along the way you've thought to yourself, what happened to that person? Like, you know, <laughs> what what happened? They they went down some path, and they're not you, they're not recognizable from their former self. Yes, uh, somebody maybe whose name rhymes with Schmen Schmerinwald, Schmer- <laughs> uh, who really did. Incre- ben, I was trying to say so. I was trying to keep it neutral by saying, regardless of your political orientation. So, thanks. <laughs> yep, I, I definitely ruined it there. Um, I think, to me, he's the the foremost example, and I'm not going to attack him personally, but I I do think he actually has a a very, a a set of very consistent principles that he's had for a long time. Yeah. Uh, And the work he did with working with Edward Snowden uh, to uncover some of the dirty secrets of our national security agency um, is, was extraordinary and was a remarkable feat of journalism. Yeah. But then he's gotten so far down a rabbit hole of fighting against his perceived enemies that he ends up making common cause with people that, you know, I think if he were to step back and be given truth serum, it's like, why are these people your friends? Mm -hmm. Uh, And why are, why are you speaking at their events? Um, You know, and, and, he would defend it. He would say that he's doing it out of that principle. I would say, you know, it's important to to um, keep your perspective and realize that just because you're trying to protect the rights of everybody doesn't have to doesn't mean you have to go out of your way to make common cause with them. So right. that would just be a, a word of caution. But right. I assume many people listening to this uh, like this particular journalist far more than they like me or you. <laughs> <laughs> Count on it. <laughs> uh, so I certainly respect yes. that perspective. Address your letters to Ben Yellen at caveat at thecyberwire.com. <laughs> exactly. Don't blame, don't blame Dave, blame did, Dave on this I did one. my best, dear listeners. I did my best. <laughs> yes. And if I get angry emails about this, uh, yeah, I kind of walked right into that there one. There you go. All right. Well, let's move on, Ben. <laughs> Let's move on. Good timing. Yeah. So we'll have links to both of those uh, stories in the show notes, of course. Um, My story this week uh, comes from the the folks over at Ars Technica. This is an article written by John Brodkin, uh, and it's titled, Supreme Court Seeks Biden Admin Input on Texas and Florida Social Media Laws. Uh, This caught my attention for a couple of reasons. Let's just start with the top here. Uh, Honestly, um, first thing that perked up my ears was... This Supreme Court is asking for the opinion of the Biden administration. Yeah, so you and I were talking about uh, <laughs> we're talking about football when right. I first came into the office. I'm yeah. a huge fan. You're not as much of a fan, but you uh, I tu- enjoy it. Yeah, you enjoy yeah. it. You tuned in this weekend, and one thing we see a lot of in football games is punting. Uh-huh. Your offensive possession has failed, so you punt uh, to the other team to. Uh, live another day. That's kind of what the Supreme Court is doing here. Okay. I'm not sure it's actually that interested in the input of the Biden administration, although I'm sure it is interested. Yeah. Um, but I think there is a circuit split here. We yeah. have two cases, a Texas and a, and a Florida case. The laws are different in some respects, but in many ways similar. And I think the Supreme Court is having a hard time determining whether they want to hear this case on the merits. Well, let's, just, yeah. let's back up and, and explain the, the the circuit split here, the cases, and what led us to this being in front of the Supreme Court at all. Can you give us a little of the background? Sure. Uh, so we'll start with the Florida law. It makes it uh, That law makes it illegal for large social media sites, the Facebooks and Twitters of the world, mm-hmm. to ban politicians. Mm. Um, that law was blocked by a federal judge on a preliminary injunction, uh, and that injunction was upheld by the Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. They said that that law likely violates the First Amendment rights of these social media platforms who can who have the right to exercise a degree of editorial control. Right. They're private companies. As it, you exactly. and I have talked about here, they, they – so this interpretation of the First Amendment says that they have the right to include or exclude anybody they want on their platform as long as they're not – some, you know, it's not based on one of the protected categories. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And, you know, the principle underlying this is 
our constitutional rights, with some exceptions, apply against government action and not against private actors, mm-hmm. which is why, you know, when I was in private school growing up and some kid invoked their First Amendment rights, they'd say, yeah, that's uh, – that." First Amendment doesn't give you the right to use swear words in our eighth grade history <laughs> class. Uh, we're we're a, a private entity, and that's not going to save you. Okay. Uh, so that was the decision uh, in the Eleventh Circuit uh, based on that Florida law. Separately, there was a Texas law. I think we've talked a little bit more about the Texas law uh, yes. on this podcast. Yes. The law is a little different. It prohibits social media companies from moderating content based on a user's viewpoint. So it's seeking to outlaw viewpoint discrimination on these platforms. Um, This law, too, was initially blocked by a federal judge, but the injunction blocking that law was stayed by the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, Uh which I'll note is a notoriously conservative court. Okay. And a three-judge panel on the Fifth Circuit said that uh, this was a proper action by, or at least preliminarily, this is a proper action by the Texas state legislature, uh, that they were kind of flirting with this idea that social media companies, due to their significant reach and due to the lack of competition uh, among big tech companies, almost serve as public platforms. uh, And it's within the interest of a state to try and root out this type of viewpoint discrimination. Mm. Uh, So these cases, even though the laws are slightly different, the outcome of these cases are certainly at odds with one another. Yeah. Uh, it's basically how far uh, do we extend the First Amendment rights of these platforms to regulate content as they see fit? Uh, I think that's really the essential question that this boils down to. Uh, and I think people were looking to see whether the Supreme Court would Uh, take this up. The only hint we had uh, was what happened last year, which is that the Supreme Court, as part of their so-called shadow docket, voted to vacate the Fifth Circuit ruling that revived the Texas law. What's that mean? Uh, It means that once the Fifth Circuit uh, upheld the Texas law, the Supreme Court voted to overturn that Fifth Circuit ruling. Uh, so putting taking that law back off the books, in other words. Okay, okay. Um, but then... Without the, comment. Without comment. There okay. was uh, there were three uh, vocal dissenters uh, in, in that decision, three of the conservative justices, and then Justice Kagan dissented from that decision but didn't give a reason for it, hmm. um, which I think is, is puzzling to a lot of uh, observers. Yeah. Uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals... Uh, which had previously restored the social media law, um, ended up reconsidering the case based on the Supreme Court's admonition uh, and sided with Texas again in a more lengthy ruling in which they had properly explained their reasoning. Uh, And they said, quote, we reject the idea that corporations have a freewheeling First Amendment right to censor what people say. Can you help me understand the process here uh, that that when when the Supreme Court made their decision that that wasn't it? It was not it because they were making a decision about the preliminary injunction and whether it was proper for the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals to silently stay the lower court decision without considering all of the facts and the arguments and having a full hearing. Oh. So what the Supreme Court was saying is the process here was inadequate. We are reinstating the district court decision because the appeals court was just a little too hasty. Uh, Hmm. They didn't go through the full procedures to understand the legal implications of this case. I see. So what the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals did was say, okay, then let's go through the procedures. Let's have hearings. (laughs) Let's have... uh, You asked for it. Yeah, exactly. And that's (laughs) what we're going to do. Let's have testimony. uh, (laughs) And they had all that. They wrote a longer decision explaining their reasoning. And now that decision is uh, back in front of the Supreme Court for the Supreme Court's consideration. I see. And that's where we stand today. That's where we stand. Uh, So we're not going to have oral arguments on either of these cases for the time being. Uh, I think the court really does want to hear what the Justice Department has to say about this. Uh, And I'm sure the Justice Department will uh, write in with some type of amicus brief, friend of the court brief, saying... You know, the Justice Department believes, and I would guess that this is what they're going to say, although I'm not 100% sure, but they'll probably say that they do think that these companies have a First Amendment right to moderate content um, as as they see fit as as private companies. And it's possible that the Solicitor General, if these these cases do make it to oral argument— 
will kind of argue the side of the 11th Circuit in Florida uh, right alongside some of the attorneys uh, in that original case. Hmm. Uh, so they could be end up being sort of a quasi-party uh, once this comes into oral arguments. But again, this is also a, a tactic to kind of uh, delay the consideration of these two cases Um, It's possible that the court is having difficulty even forming a consensus as to whether to grant certiorari, whether to hear uh, this case case on the merits. And this might have been an intermediate step to get some input from the Biden administration, the Justice Department, before they make that final decision. And would the Supreme Court bundle these two together because of the split with the circuits? Um, I would guess that they would hear them separately. There would be two separate oral arguments, Uh uh, but the decisions will be relatively reflective of one another. Um, It's usually the type of thing where if you have two similar cases like this, they're heard separately, but the decisions are released on the same day so that you get kind of a snapshot of where the justices think the law is on this issue. I see. Um, You know, because the statutes are different and because we're dealing with a different set of facts and and, uh, parties, uh, I don't think it would be appropriate to hear this as a consolidated case, mm. um, but I do think the outcome in one case is going to be heavily influenced by the outcome of the other case. Now, it's possible, you know, maybe there was a procedural defect in one of the cases, and maybe they don't get to the merits of that case. Uh, maybe they only decide the Texas case because the lawyer in the Florida case, you know, <laughs> didn't file the appeal uh, within the proper time frame or something. Right. right. Um, but my guess is that. These will be released concurrently, but in two separate cases. Do you have any sense for how this Supreme Court might view something like this? So we only have bits and pieces based on past writing of the justices. We've talked about how Justice Thomas, who is one of, if not the most conservative justice on the court, Mm -hmm. has suggested that we might need to reconsider how we look at some of these big tech companies uh, and their power to moderate content more in the context of a uh, common carrier. So like a cable company or a railroad where these are private companies, but but they perform a certain type of public function and should be regulated as such. Okay. there is some indication that at least a couple of the other conservative justices are amenable uh, to that argument. And then uh, we got that mini uh, view into the mind of Justice Kagan when she uh, dissented in that decision to, to kick the case back to the Texas court. Uh, but I don't think we have any firm indication one way, or in, uh, one way or another about how five justices think on this issue. We're kind of just reading the tea leaves at this point. Yeah. Do you think it's inevitable that this issue is going to make it to the Supreme Court? I do. Yeah, I think because of the high-profile nature of this issue, because we have a circuit split, um, and because clearly the Supreme Court is interested in it, they didn't Mm -hmm. just reject it outright. They said, hey, we'd like the Justice Department to weigh in on it. Mm -hmm. I think those are all strong indications um, that probably by next fall uh, we'll have oral arguments in, in these two cases. All right. Well, we'll get our popcorn out. (laughs) We sure will, yeah. (laughs) That's right. All right. Well, we will have a link to that story in the show notes. Uh, We would love to hear from you. If there's something you'd like us to discuss here on the show, you can email us. It's caveat at thecyberwire.com. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. Ben. 
Men, it is always a treat when Carol Terrio contributes content to our CyberWire shows here, and today is uh, no exception to that. She has a really fascinating uh, discussion with Rory Keflin Jones. Uh, he's a former BBC reporter, uh, and they're discussing healthcare and the uh, digitization of that. Here's Carol Terrio speaking with Rory Keflin Jones. I am thrilled today to be chatting with the celebrated Rory Keflin Jones. If you are outside the UK, you may not know him, but you could think of him as I do, the David Attenborough of technology. <laughs> I knew that would make you laugh, but it's true. That's really sweet of you. <laughs> it's true, and it's well deserved. Now, Rory, why don't you share a little bit of a, about your background for our listeners? Well, I worked for one organization for 40 years, which is, you know, above and beyond these days. I worked for the BBC for 40 years uh, until a year ago. And for much of the last 20 years, I was the BBC's technology correspondent, uh, in particular covering the whole smartphone era. If you think of the smartphone era as starting with the unveiling of the iPhone uh, by Steve Jobs in 2007, and I was there when that happened. Um, that was the sort of the meat and drink of my career, the extraordinary period that followed that and how much changed. And you've also written a few books. Yeah, I wrote a book 20 years ago about the dot-com bubble, and I wrote a book that came out last year about that smartphone era and how those miraculous little devices in all our pockets combined with social media produce an extraordinary, powerful force in our lives, which at first we thought was almost university for the good. And then we began, began to worry about it a bit. So, yeah. And you also, you're very busy. You also are run. can I call it a blog on Substack? Is that a blog? Well, it, yeah, it's a newsletter. Yeah, it's today's blog, let's be honest, isn't it? That's, <laughs> that's what Substack is. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you started a blog. Now you start a Substack. That's right. And and it's called Rory's Always On Newsletter. And and you write on your about page, uh, quote, I spent 15 years as BBC technology correspondent in a period where the smartphone and social media changed just about everything, but had surprisingly little impact on healthcare. And that's a fascinating point. Can you expand on that a little? Yeah. Um, looking in, in my book at uh, the impact of the smartphone, what very much came to mind was Peter Thiel's famous quote about we were promised flying cars and we got 140 characters, of course, which became 280 characters uh, with Twitter, making the point that it, it was all a bit trivial. Yet yeah, these devices have the power, the potential to transform healthcare. Mm. And I was frustrated with uh, how slowly that that has been happening and wanted to track that in this newsletter. And I've got a particular interest in it, both professionally and personally, in that I have two long-term conditions, uh, one of them being Parkinson's, and would like to see this technology start delivering some benefits in those areas. So what are some of the limitations that you've encountered, the things that you have found frustrating as a patient? Well, the, the technology arrives and it has extraordinary potential, but then it comes up against healthcare management and healthcare organizations, which move quite slowly, sometimes for very good reasons. If we think about Theranos, the scandal of the Theranos company, mm. with its supposedly brilliant blood testing te technology. Fascinating, that whole story was. But there was one venture capitalist who backed Elizabeth Holmes, the CEO, right to the end and said, effectively, well, you know, you've got, you've got to try a few things and sometimes they go wrong and sometimes you, you, you just move on. Mm. He had this sort of move fast and break things attitude, which is pervasive in Silicon Valley. That just doesn't work in healthcare for obvious reasons. So <laughs> I interviewed recently an eye surgeon, a brilliant eye surgeon, who also works some of the time for Google's DeepMind AI unit. Um, and he had developed an algorithm which would effectively triage the millions of eye scans that are now produced by high street automatrists and which are, are flooding our national health service and creating a problem, frankly, because we've got this brilliant technology and it produces a lot of false positives. You, you haven't got the staff to actually understand those, those scans. Ah. And, and he developed uh, an AI optometrist, basically, an, an AI expert in in, in 
understanding them and saying, that's bad, that isn't. But what he said to me, and this is a couple of years ago now, he said, kind of idea to algorithm, uh, idea to code, maybe two years. Code clinic, i.e. get it actually in use by doctors, a hell of a lot longer. So there's the technology and then there's the 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 whole um bureaucratic infrastructure and as i said bureaucratic often for good reasons the regulatory infrastructure and that's not great in this country in the uk and i think you know it's very variable for instance in the united states it depends very much on um you know local healthcare providers and insurers and so on how how rapidly they can channel uh, innovation into actual patient care. Hmm. What's happening in this country is that gradually that interaction between patients and doctors is being digitized, is being made better. I did laugh the other day. I was involved in chairing a panel at the medical technology conference on something called patient centric care. And they laughed when I said, Well, what other kind is there? Oh, as if I would tell you about it. <laughs> Uh, and it became clear that for years there'd been what, what you might call product-centric care, i.e. it was all about flogging this pill or that treatment. But gradually, patient-centric care is becoming a thing. Every, every drug, new drug now, is probably going to come with an app um, to, to kind of guide the patient and maybe provide feedback to the doctor about how the 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 drug is working there's a lot of work going on in using smartphones this is coming back to where we started the the benefits of smartphone technology mm. to to provide that interaction between patient and doctor and to provide remote monitoring mm -hmm. i was in the eye hospital i visit regularly the other day and they were promoting uh, an app where you could do your own eye test at home patients who were you know being monitored didn't necessarily need to come in to have an, their eyes tested. They could do their own eye test using this app, and the, that would be analysed probably by an algorithm. Um, and, you know, if there was something of concern, then they would be called in. Wow. So the future is bright in a way because there's no other route. The technology and healthcare will eventually mesh together invisibly into this one new kind of vortex of health, I imagine. Well, there will be all sorts of problems along the way and arguments about ethics. You know, there's all sorts of arguments around, as we know, the ethics of AI. Yeah. Whether we trust it to make those decisions to say, you know, this person does needs to be seen, this person doesn't. But yeah, uh, gradually... The promise, and it's been a promise for a long time, of the, that combination of smartphones and artificial intelligence, I think will be realised. If you guys want to follow this rocky journey, please follow Rory on Rory's Always On newsletter. Rory, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's an absolute pleasure to speak with you. <laughs> it's been great fun. Ben, what do you think? Oh, such a great interview um, and really a compelling guest. He's had 40 years uh, of media experience and he's had his own experience in uh, the healthcare system, which is obviously very different from ours. Yeah. Uh, but I think some of the values that he talked about, how the technology is great and promising, uh, but if we don't know how to use it properly, it's not going to uh, accrue to the benefit of patients. Uh, I thought that was really fascinating and that... The fact that there's even a question as to whether we should pursue patient-centered healthcare, um, it's just it, it's, it was just interesting uh, to hear him invoke that. So I thought that was a really interesting interview. Yeah, absolutely. Again, our thanks to Carol Terrio uh, and Rory Keflin Jones for uh, joining us. We do appreciate them taking the time. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. 
As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening. Listening.